user card in us has one of those really rich descriptive bios that looks great on paper and screen, but so much more interesting and revealing when you peel back the layers and discover this really rich map of consistent, thoughtful political activity. Uh, artivist, uh, artist, activist, poet, performer, student, writer, educator, mixed race, trans femme, Latina, PhD student in media arts and practice and provost fellow at USC, member of the Art Collective Electronic Disturbance Theater 2.0, former fellow at the Post Media Lab at Leofana University, New Direction Scholar at the USC Center for Feminist Research, uh, MacArthur Foundation Haystack Scholar. So these are just among the myriad descriptive terms one might encounter in Misha's bio. Uh, additionally, Misha holds an MFA in Visual Arts from UCSD, an MA in Communication from the European Graduate School, and a BS in Computer Science from Florida International University. So, yeah, Misha has a really extensive CV, but it's far from fluff or padding. One descriptor that doesn't appear as frequently in Misha's academic bio is the generic activist or the more specific community builder. But it's because of this emphasis on community building and engagement uh, in Misha's work that I'm so happy to have the chance to introduce her today. Uh, I've had the fortune of, of seeing Misha present a few times previously, both here in Toronto and at the Allied Media Conference in Detroit. And what inspires me about hearing her speak is the sort of seamless way she moves between direct, tangible examples of, of new technologies and, and also high theoretical concepts. Now this trait isn't exclusive to Misha's uh, um, presentation style. Arguably, uh, it's endemic in her work, which fuses applied technical engagement with critical, deeply considered theoretical approaches, experimental tactics, and an unflinching tendency to approach topics of study not with a sense of awe necessarily, but a focus on who they might benefit and how. This research inhabits the intersection of technology and politics, and treats movement not just as a topic of research interest, but as a technology of change. I hate to use like patronizing terms like emerging or, 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 or those sort of things to describe someone like Nisha, as it tends to do two things. First, it, it sort of implies uh, emergence from a state of academic infancy when judging by Misha's very prolific recent scholarly activity, from co-authoring books to writing articles on a really diverse array of subjects. This can, in fact, be a, a truly fruitful period for the development of long-term projects, as well as an opportunity to establish unique documentation and research, uh, and, and, and research demonstration practices that buck conventional trends. Uh, but more importantly, it diminishes any pre-academic or non-scholarly or extra-academic work. And in fact, Misha's quote-unquote activist work uh, from the brilliant trans-border immigrant tool that she helped develop at, at UCSD, which it should be noted, no less than Glenn Beck uh, called for America in general to turn off the taps to the universities that support scholars like Misha, uh, which is a badge of honor in my opinion. Um, th these are, are just as interesting as, as the, the more formal academic work that makes up Misha's uh, uh, scholarly output, so to speak and is in fact how I came to be familiar with her in the first place. Uh, again, I hate these sort of terms and if it's, if it, as if it isn't already the responsibility of all of us to be doing this, but Misha really is pushing the envelope uh, with how she incorporates technologies and paradigms from wearable computing or, or embodied interaction. Uh, while so much of the wearable community seems focused on making blinky hats or, or personal surveillance tools, Misha uses wearables to explore how inhabiting space between artificial binaries, male, female, digital, material, empowered, disempowered, natural, unnatural, uh, often requires mixed, multi, uh, multiple, or, or blurry modes of interaction, and alternative multi-voiced logics. And while others who might also proclaim that movement is a technology of change are busy waving their hands at gestural sensors to trigger predictable responses, control of an on-screen avatar, for example, uh, Misha dashes away from the trivial, shifting a critical glance at these so-called revolutionary technologies, raising a middle finger at the connect wall, at the same time questioning what it means to inhabit the avatar through embodied, gestural, or immersive modes. So in this spirit, Misha's project on local, autonomous, uh, local autonomy networks, which was selected for the 2012-01 biennial in, in San Jose, uh, and will be the subject of discussion today, and I gather, among other things, 
Um, Upends how network engineers, information theorists, and policymakers might imagine mesh networks or community information infrastructure, sort of away from questions of access and voice and toward the shaping of new technologies for tactical and economic strategies. Misha embodies this sort of critical, engaged approach that I've always hoped wouldn't die with a PhD. Uh, the, the same dream that pirate radio builders who trade secrets with electrical engineers might have. Uh, or DIY book publishers who get information degrees and then go and build their own presses in order to challenge or disrupt the capitalist publishing industry might also have. So for this and, and, and many other reasons, I'm really excited for Misha's presentation today as I think we, we have the chance to recognize a scholar committed to technical practice, theoretical engagement, boundary pushing research, as well as political, uh, political action and equal measures. So uh, I'd like to turn it over to Misha. Thank you so much, Gabby and Patrick, for those generous introductions. It will be hard to live up to. Um, and, oh, awesome. <laughs> no. It's back. It's back. OK, awesome. Um, well, so I decided to change my talk a little bit today since um, to be in dialogue with the series, and Shannon Bell is here and mentioned my work, and she's such an inspiration of mine. So I thought that we might start with some sexually explicit performance art first. Oh, internet. <laughs> Confounding the networks. Okay. Okay, so that was from an older series of work that I did with my uh, former partner, Ellie Marymount. That was called Virus Circus. And so it was like what I did after Becoming Dragon and before my current work. Um, you could turn the lights back on, please. Uh, and so, so Virus Circus uh, it was an episodic series of performances exploring a speculative world of queer futures of latex sexuality and DIY medicine in resistance to virus hysteria. Performances used wearable electronics, soft sensors, and live audio to bridge virtual and physical spaces. The performances were thinking about how the history of queer politics shows that the rhetoric of viruses such as HIV are used to control marginalized populations, while the present transnational politics of viruses such as H1N1, or at the time, H1N1 was quite a hysteria, especially living on the US-Mexico border, uh, unearth the militarization of medical authority, microscopic migrations, and global inequities. So this particular piece, Virus Circus Probe, imagines the DIY medical resistance engaging in their own viral testing techniques as foreplay and sex. And so a lot of my work has been concerned with this imagining um, futures of technology and gender and sexuality and thinking about ways that technology changes gender and sexuality every day um, and also potentially in the future. Um, and so previously, I, I was really interested in this kind of post-digital horizon being something like biotech, like computers that we would grow and DNA computing. And so a lot of my work, like Becoming Dragon and Virus Circus, I was really interested in thinking about these things. But also at the time, I was much more invested in like making um, what, <laughs> what Rita Rayleigh calls tactical gizmology, or making lots of devices that I felt like actually had to work. So for that performance, we actually made a thrust sensing dildo so that the amount of thrust that a person put on the dildo would give them a, a proportional amount of vibration on their uh, genitalia also. Um, but also in that performance and in that series we used a lot of um, biometric sensors or bioinformatic sensors like uh, heart rate monitors and visualized them in different ways and played the sound of our heartbeats through our Second Life avatars. So we're thinking about creating transreal performances in multiple ways. One way of being like merging fiction and, um, and reality. Um, but another way being merging things like the virtual world of Second Life with the physical world through different ways. One was through linking our avatars to our bodies through uh, biometrics. OK, so now the real talk starts. Uh, so first, I want to thank Patrick for bringing me here and organizing this amazing speaker series. I'm really honored to be alongside the other people in the series. Um, also, 
I want to acknowledge that we are on unceded and stolen Mississauga new credit territory. So in this talk, you should consider that this talk comes in a context of colonization. And I myself am recently a settler here in Canada. Uh, so very much an active participant in that violence. Um, and let's see, we were going to do this. We'll do that later. Um, so, um, <laughs> So Virus Circus, uh, so it was a series of performances and then at the end we did this piece that's on the cover of my trans real book that was called Virus Circus Laboratory where we took all these artifacts from the performance and presented them in a gallery setting all together and presented them in this augmented reality installation that was um, ima an imaginary computational system that relied on female ejaculate fluid to, to work, to run. Um, so this is thinking about the affect in computing, uh, thinking about why is it that our affect is supposed to be sitting at this typewriter and being business automatons that are so bored with our lives, and why not have computers that rely on pleasure? Um, so yeah, we presented these artifacts that we used in the performances, like this distance sensing bra. Um, and we had this augmented reality view of the installation, <laughs> Um, through which viewers could see a 3D video of the same table and the same instruments being used by the two of us masturbating and ejaculating on the table, which we performed in Toronto also at the Toronto Free Gallery. It was my first time here. It was pleasant. <laughs> um, I don't have that video for you because it's only a stereoscopic video. Also, I don't show that work that much since it's my, my body's really different. It's weird showing it. But a lot of my work is thinking about the subject in transition anyway, so I guess that's part of the, part of the deal. Okay, so today I want to discuss my two current projects and uh, get my timer to work. The Transborder Immigrant Tool and Local Autonomy Networks. So I've collaborated with the Electronic Disturbance Theater since 2008 to create the Transborder Immigrant Tool. We have described it as a quote, so when I say we, these, these quotes are from the collective, so I'm not attributing to specific people. Um, we all have different motivations and desires and requirements from that project, um, but we do often write collectively. So we've described it as a poetic gesture and safety device equipped to identify water caches on the U.S. side of the Mexico-U.S. border. The Transborder Immigrant Tool repurposes inexpensive used mobile phones that have GPS antennae, not intended to resolve the long histories of fear, prejudice, and misunderstanding on both sides of the border. The Transborder Immigrant Tool is beholden to the often overlapping traditions of transcendental and nature writing, earthworks, conceptual art, performance, border art, locative media, visual and concrete poetries. So our project represents both a conversation piece, a reminder that people are dying, and an ethical intervention, a hand extended to those who are lost and dehydrated. Based on a key technical question, can sub $20 phones be made useful for emergency navigation? It learns equally from the efforts of humanitarian aid organizations like Border Angels and Water Stations Inc. As poetry in motion, the TBT navigates the borderlands of GPS as a global positioning system and what, in another context, Laura Borras Castanier and Juan B. Gutierrez slyly misread as a glo global poetic system. So the Electronic Disturbance Theater, which I'm a part of, has referred to the TBT as an example of science of the oppressed, an approach that is informed by forms of knowledge production that are marginalized by the rational focus of the digital. So the fundamental operations of digital technology and or and not are derived from George Boole's development of Boolean logic, which was first described in the pamphlet Mathematical Analysis of Logic, published in 1847. While the Boolean logic that's the basis of digital technology is based in Western systems of reason, science of the oppressed includes concepts such as fem science and Mayan technology, uh, which is, was proposed by Ricardo Dominguez to signify nonlinear causalities in technologies, such as the stick the little Ma Mayan boy waves at the Mexican army helicopter and says, Karoom, 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 and makes the helicopter go away. Uh, science of the oppressed also takes inspiration from methodology of the oppressed and, um, and uh, theater of the oppressed and a number of other traditions. So I propose that a related method that I'll talk about today for both theory and practice can be found in trans of color experience, which I refer to as trans of color praxis. 
So the phone in included in this global poetic system, the phone included uh, poetry. So that users, when they turned on the phone, would hear, have the option of hearing poems. Um, and also we displayed the phone in galleries and museums with the poetry sometimes. So this is one of the concrete poems that went with it. Certainly part of the thinking of the project was thinking about um, the trans and transborder, thinking about transgender migrants, um, thinking about how uh, nationality or the status of being undocumented potentially destabilizes one's gender. Um, and so often in displayed in galleries and museums looks like this and uh, plays, you know, shows these poems and also plays the sound of the poems. But also uh, the poet who wrote most of the poems on the phone, Amy Sarah Carroll, who's part of Electronic Disturbance Theater, she, uh, she wrote a series of poems designed to be distributed on the phone, which were encoding desert survival information. So these were poems that would tell you um, how to collect water in the desert, or how to determine what a cactus looks like that is poisonous versus a cactus that has drinkable water inside. Um, so those are the poems that were intended to be distributed on the phone. Um, the phone, uh, this project was never, never went beyond a beta stage, um, despite Oh, so this is a picture of what the interface looked like. We called it a witching interface because we used this vibration that would indicate when you're facing the right way, it would vibrate, or when you arrive at the water, it would vibrate in case you didn't understand the language of the interface. Um, but yeah, it received a lot of media attention, a lot of right-wing media attention. Um, Glenn Beck actually said our poetry would dissolve the nation, which I thought was quite a good review as an artist. Um, and. Um, it resulted in multiple criminal investigations, so a, um, a police investigation, a university police investigation, and an FBI investigation, um, which slowed down the development of the tool quite a bit um, and found that we did not misuse any of our measly $5,000, um, which probably took them $100,000 to find out that we didn't misuse any of our money, but that was, that was the outcome of those investigations and that project. Um, so currently we're still displaying it and we've still been testing it, but um, it's not quite clear if we're going to distribute it. Um, partly because of the cost problem. So the, we, we envisioned this project to work on like $20 Nextel phones that you find on eBay. Uh, and then once the software was written and developed and it's been tested by the me collective members and a few artists now, we find that uh, the GPS system in $20 phones is very slow and not terrifically reliable. Uh, so the ethical question of giving somebody something and saying this might help you is very questionable. Uh, so also the, the part of the res another part of the conclusion of the investigation is that if we, the legality of actually giving the phone to people in Mexico who plan to cross is very different than this legality of uh, testing our prototypes. Um, so we have not distributed it yet. Nobody but us has used it, which I'm not sure a lot of people know, given that there's been a lot of hoo-ha about it. Um, okay, so moving on. So towards the end of, um, where's the, in my notes? So towards the end of working on the, not towards the end, but after many years, after like five years of working on the TBT, I started this new project, Local Autonomy Networks. And so I was at the Allied Media Conference, and um, was in a workshop, and this amazing, inspirational black feminist scholar of time and space travel, Alexis Pauline Gums, mm -hmm. said in a comment in her workshop, I have a vision of a post-digital future where the kind of communication we have today with cell phones and internet seems like an ancient relic, and a memory support that supports that vision is that my ancestors could communicate telepathically. So this really spoke to me as an inspiration and as a way of thinking about uh, possible horizons of, of uh, wearable electronics and of, and of sensing networks. Because uh, I was working on developing uh, this, okay, I'm gonna go back to this text. So my work on the TBT led me to local autonomy networks, a project being developed in collaboration with community-based organizations, including Gender Justice Los Angeles, Ally Media Projects, Detroit Represent, and Zero Bentiu Nueve in Bogota, Colombia. So from the 
temporary shutdown of the piratebay.org and wikileaks.org at the DNS level, or the common shutdown at the DNS level of virtual sit-ins, to the shutdown of cell phone communications to prevent protest in Egypt from Egypt to San Francisco. Corporate communications infrastructures are obsolete increasingly for resistant communities. So in contrast, people in resistance are imagining new post-digital futures, namely Alexis Pauline Gumbs. So this is one of my main inspirations for this project. So Local Autonomy Networks is an artivist project focused on creating networks of communication to increase community autonomy and reduce violence against women, LGBTQI people, people of color, disabled people, sex workers, and other groups who continue to survive violence on a daily basis. The networks are both offline and online, including handmade wearable electronic fashion and face-to-face -face agreements between people. The networks are being established through a series of workshops, performances, presentations, and discussions at art activists and academic venues in the Americas and Europe. So Autonets is the main example of transit color praxis that I'll be discussing today. So Autonets started with a line of mesh networked electronic clothing. I'll come back to them in a moment. Uh, with the goal of building autonomous local networks that don't rely on corporate infrastructure to function. Inspired by community racist, community based, anti racist, <laughs> community based, anti racist, prison abolitionist responses to gender violence. So the Autonet's garments, when activated, would alert anyone, everyone in range of the local mesh network who's wearing another Autonet's garment that someone needs help and will facilitate that person's direction and distance. So, um, so this is one of them that I'm wearing. I guess I should show it like on. Um, so I started early on in this series making um, hoodies because it was recently after Trayvon Martin's murder. And, um, and the first series I made was for folks in Detroit. And hopefully the battery is going to still have power. Ha, maybe not. Um, yeah, OK. Well, you don't get to see the blinky lights and the tactical gizmology. But I'll pass it around anyway. Have people seen wearable electronics? Raise your hand. Have people made wearable electronics? OK, cool. Um, so yeah, so I started with hoodies and dresses, because those were things that I wanted and I thought people might want. Um, uh, but then, let's see. So these technologies were developed through workshops and collective design processes inspired by existing networks of horizontal knowledge production in queer, trans, femme, survivor, and diasporic communities. So I've been in collaboration with groups wanting to use Autonets to prevent violence against gender, queer, and trans people of color in LA, which is actually why I started this project. I was thinking about how could I spend my time making art, uh, making myself feel safer, because I feel in danger on a daily basis. Being a trans woman of color means being part of a group who there's one of us killed every month in the US for being part of this group. Or globally, there's basically one of us killed every day for being a uh, trans woman of color. So I do, yeah, at the time, especially transitioning in San Diego, which is a very racist military place shaped by the, the whole aspect of the place is really shaped by the border. Um, yeah, I started this project when I lived there, and I felt in danger every day. Um, so I started thinking, okay, I started feeling a little itchy about the Transporter Immigrant Tool being a project that's, you know, supposed to be for the safety of somebody else, like this community that we're not necessarily a part of. I think Shannon's proposition that you should not write about something you haven't done is really interesting and provocative and something to think about. Uh, and. So yeah, so I wanted to start making this technology that would be more for me and my communities instead of other people's communities. Um, yeah. But also, so over the two years of work on this project, oh, I guess it's three years now, <laughs> or almost three, it's become clear that the non-digital social networks are far more important than the digital technologies involved, because even if the technology worked perfectly flawlessly, and it's still a prototype with lots of technical issues to be solved. The technology would still rely on the human will to respond and the social agreements as to what to do in case someone in the network needs help. So my first prototype was the hoodies, a political symbol I felt needed attention given the dialogue around Trayvon Martin's murder. 
by a neighborhood watch participant and Cece McDonald, who is another main inspiration. Cece McDonald is a transgender woman who, uh, in the US who was the target of a racist transphobic attack in 2011, who fought back against her attacker and saved her life, but as a result was forced to serve a multi-year sentence in a men's prison. Yet, so I, I did also didn't want to do, reproduce this dynamic that often, ha often happens in social practice art, where artists come up with a solution and then they drop into a community and they're like, look, I have the solution for you, I'll see you later. Um, I, yeah, I'm not, into, not so into that. So as soon as I made the prototypes, I started doing workshops with people and, um, and um, so one of those groups was uh, this collective in Detroit for women of color called Strong and Beautiful. And so they, uh, I met at the Allied Media Conference, were mostly teenagers, expressed the sentiments that, yes, a hoodie's nice, but uh, especially in Detroit, you can't wear a hoodie most of the year, because <laughs> it's like 40 degrees um, in the summer. And they wanted something they could wear every day, so they said, maybe I can make bracelets. So I made these bracelets as the kind of most simple version of AutoNet. So this bracelet just has a battery and a wireless transmitter in it. So the XB wireless transmitters are mesh networked and you can get versions that transmit up to a mile. Uh, and so what their mesh network, what that means is that they communicate to each other instead of communicating top down to a phone company. So like your cell phone relies on a connection to a cell phone tower and all that. Uh, the XBs just communicate directly to each other. But since they're mesh network, the more of them you have, the wider the signal reaches. So if you have a one mile range with one XB, then you could double it by having two, or if you have three, you know, roughly the size would be larger of your coverage area. Um, so, so we've used these uh, prototypes for, to kind of start conversations in workshops. Um, and so is it kind of like Grant Kester talks about contemporary artist conversation pieces. Um, and developed movement in workshops by, uh, through conversations about these prototypes. Um, and, okay. So through my collaborations with queer and trans people who are most often survivors of violence, I really began to question the usefulness of wearable electronics given their high cost. So I'm currently in dialogue with members of Gender Justice LA and Zero Nueve in Bogota to consider other lo-fi or no-fi approaches to creating communication networks to enable safety. So that's a good point to say that. Um, I also feel like this, hmm, I feel like this knowledge is not necessarily mine, uh, that this knowledge like really comes from communities. And I feel like uh, more than um, you know, communities benefiting from exposure to the art world or from research, um, actually Shira Hassan of Young Women's Empowerment Project at my Chicago AutoNets workshop said that um, oftentimes research is another form of violence against marginalized communities. So she was talking in particular about um, youth who were sex workers and how often researchers would um, interview them and talk to them and then write research that was actually really harmful to them. Um, so, so instead, uh, yeah, what I've tried to do is like have more long-term engagements with communities and like retain a, a iterative dialogic process where I'm like making a prototype, talking to people about it, making modifications, talking to more people about it, you know, sharing that work and continuing the dialogue. So, um, so I've been working with these groups in LA and Detroit and Toronto um, for over a year each and have done lots of workshops in each of those places. Toronto probably is the fewest, or I've only done like three workshops here. Um, there's the fashion shoot for Makeshift Magazine. <laughs> mm. Okay, there's the obligatory code shot uh, so that you can see some of the code that makes the prototypes run. Um, so initially I was thinking about making GPS transmitters. These devices have GPS transmitters so that when you enable your device, you would be able to find the direction to the person who needs help. Um, but very quickly upon talking to groups who might want to use the device, like sex workers, they were like, no thanks, we'll pass on the whole GPS coordinate transmission. 
um, or working with Cero Ventinueve in Colombia, they're trying to prevent, is prevent the fact that students are commonly disappeared by the government. So the government of Colombia gets more money depending on how many bodies of guerrillas they produce. So they just kidnap students and dress them up like guerrillas and then, uh, yeah. Uh, so, so that group there was trying to prevent that. So they were like, we do not want GPS transmitters, GPS transmitter bracelets that we could get from the police state anyway, just by being on parole. Um, so, so early on I tried to work on just the, the prototypes that I've made so far, as far as they've got with direction, is just determining proximity. So I'm just using really rough, if for all of you uh, electronics hackers in the room, a rough approximation of distance using the XB RSSI signal. Uh, not very uh, specific at all. Not very accurate at all. Oh wait, let's come back to that. Okay. So thinking about the limitations of these uh, technologies and the expensiveness of them, uh, in particular with this group in Bogota, who were like, that's cool that you can make a $100 networked hoodie, but if we had $100, we would buy a cell phone. Uh, lots of people in Bogota don't have cell phones. So, um, so then I w worked with them to start thinking about other modes that we could use for networking and communications. Like what are other non-digital safety techniques that people already use on a daily basis to keep themselves safe? Like what are specific actions of nonverbal communication that you could use if you were like with friends at a bar. I'm sure a lot of us know how to do that when you don't want to say out loud, hey, this guy is a jerk. Let's leave now. Um, sometimes you need a nonverbal way to get yourself out of a dangerous situation. Um, yeah. Or uh, also a lot of these interventions are site specific. So in Los Angeles, a lot of the participants there had cell phones and smartphones. Um, so part of what we did in Los Angeles was just have really a social agreement to keep each other safe and then using existing technology. So for iPhone, there's already an app that's called Circle of Six. Uh, and Circle of Six lets you set up a contact list of six people who, in case of emergency, you can just press one button and text them all your GPS coordinates. Um, so it's really similar, except that it relies on corporate infrastructure. Okay. So wanting to move away from these technologies and digital technology in general, let's talk about that. So digital technology, I would say, or many people have said, is uh, the basis for a worldview or an epistemology often referred to as the digital, which is wrapped up with Western logics. In fact, in, in Race After the Internet, Lisa Nakamura talks about the digital as, as, a, as a, another form of colonialism, as a mechanism of colonizing the world. So authors such as Wendy Chun in Program Visions and David Columbia in The Cultural Logic, Logic of Computation both point to the depth and breadth of claims that digital computers operate on the same logic as our minds, our bodies, and even reality itself. So I would propose that working towards post-digital networks is participation in a decolonization of technology and to imagine possibilities that, and allows us to imagine possibilities that both precede and follow the digital. Um, also, Sub Rosa in their book, uh, Domain Errors, talk about how this, this, I, this conflation of technology with digital technology and digital network technology is, is actually a form of racism that ignores the like, centuries of technology developed by people of color, the um, like, development of the number system right, by um, Arab people, um, or the, the the real McCoy, the development of a lubrication system for trains by this person named McCoy, African American. Anyway, that was a good essay that I recently read for Qualls. Um, okay, so my intervention into media studies is to try to make a trans of color critique, taking inspiration from, uh, well, taking inspiration from and critiquing queer of color critique authors such as Jose Munoz and Roderick Ferguson and rejecting the binary logic of the digital and looking to oppressed communities for alternative logics with which to theorize my work. So in Grant Kester's The One and the Many, he describes in detail many of the reasons leading to a widespread practice in contemporary art of privileging the knowledge of the artist as validated by an autonomous separation from social reality that simultaneously discredits the knowledge and agency of participants in and viewers of contemporary art. So Kester attributes this to both the history of aesthetic autonomy and its association with religious concepts of purity, as well as to the canonical acceptance of post-structuralism, which views all real political action as necessarily flawed and encourages experimentation to remain within the aesthetic realm. 
So with Autonets, I'm trying to reverse this common hierarchy and find other theoretical supports, such as decolonial thought, queer of color critique, like I already mentioned, and Latin American traditions, such as theory of the oppressed and border consciousness, and instead to engage in an open collective design process with the organizations I'm working with, and with you. So I should also say that these ideas are certainly in process, and I'm happy to have uh, your feedback, including your constructive criticism. So looking towards the decolonial, Diana Taylor states in the archive and the repertoire how rigid binary gender categories were a construction of colonists used to control populations, saying that from the 16th century onward, the Spanish administration in New Spain, well, Mexico, established the casta or caste system to clearly demarcate bloodlines and racial categories produced by miscegenation. Visual and performance strategies accompanied discursive ones to produce the newly racialized and gendered subjects they merely claimed to portray. In contrast, she describes the Nahua indigenous people's practice of what Mexican anthropologist Alfredo Lopez Austin calls mythic thinking that connects different social and natural processes to find equivalences in an attempt to discover an absolute congruence and total order of the universe. Taylor names this pre-digital thinking as a kind of network, saying, quote, her nonlinear way of thinking, usually associated with the semi-literate semi realm of the past, ironically resembles the digital concept of networks, circuits, and interconnectivity. Yet where Taylor applies the label of the digital to the concept of networks, one can also see from this example how the concept of uh, the conceptual mapping resulting in a spiritual connection between beings and objects can be seen as a kind of pre-digital and post-digital network. I think uh, we can all say that networks right, predate and post-date the digital. So also, what are some examples of other examples of post-digital or non-digital networks? So um, I find in Queer of Color Critique uh, some ex interesting examples. Um, so Queer of Color Critique, Roderick Ferguson describes as their decisive intervention being that racist practice articulates itself as gender and sexual regulation and that gender and sexual difference variegates racial formations. And so in, in the book, he um, critiques Marx for Marx's disparagement of sex workers and, um, and talks about you know, the, race, the racial operation in capitalist economics. And so in that way, that's one way that you could see race as a network and that it affects economics and economics are necessarily a network. Um, but also another transfer from the digital to the non-digital can be seen in the operation of race online. So like I already mentioned in Race After the Internet, Lisa Nakamura and Peter H. Howe White argue for a revisioning of race in digital technologies as a form of code, as well as a visual representation of a raced body. They quote Wendy Chun saying, race is more than its representation, more than screen deep. It's part of the algorithmic logic of games and digital media themselves. So building on these arguments, I would say you could understand if race can be understood as a form of code, it can also be understood as a form of communication. <laughs> And so we can understand the working of racialized markers such as dress, bodily characteristics, and racialized clothing as a system of communication that creates a non-digital network. And by taking this theory out of its digital context, one can see how racial identification operates as a non-digital or post-digital network of communication. So, so what precedents do we have for the kind of ubiquitous sensing of our friends and loved ones that Alexis Pauline Gumbs promised way in the beginning <laughs> that would make our current digital network seem like ancient relics and instead provide something like telepathy. Um, oh, we already went through those things. So I would point here to uh, Alicia Arizon's book, Queering Mestizaje, where she describes Gloria Anzaldúa's idea of the new mestiza consciousness as, important, as an important Chicana-Chicano post-colonial knowledge and as a theory of racial mixing and border identities of many kinds it's performed an influential role in the, in the development of women of color feminism, often cited as an inspiration for queer of color and now also trans of color critique or praxis. So Arison writes, the queering of mestizaje further represents the body as a border dweller capable of constructing its own space or la facultad that resists negation and subordination. Yet where Arison quotes Anzaldúa is where one can see this new mestiza consciousness as a kind of network. She states, la facultad is the capacity to see in surface phenomena the meaning of deeper realities. It's an instant sensing, a quick perception arrived at without conscious reasoning. 
which we might call gaydar. <laughs> or you might interpret that in other ways. Uh, Arison describes Anzaldúa's border consciousness as positioned against post-structuralist theory. And theorist of decolonization Walter Mignolo has described what he calls border thinking as a method of decolonization, which he says was inspired by Anzaldúa's border consciousness. Anzaldúa's idea of conciencia de la mestiza is also strongly influenced by Chela Sandoval's methodology of the oppressed, a main inspiration for science of the oppressed. Okay. Oh, gosh. Um, I'm just going to keep reading. Okay, so uh, how do we use or intervene in, okay, so we talked about what are some post-digital, pre-digital networks. Uh, and then I would say, how do we use or intervene in these networks? So in Joanna Zielinska and Sarah Kember's 2012 book, Life After New Media, Mediation as Vital Process, they articulate a vision of human bodies existing in a field of mediation intertwined and becoming with non-human bodies. Zielinska and Kember propose the act of the cut as an ethical act in this field. They describe the cut as processes of temporary stabilizing the world into media, agents, relations, and networks. In public performances of this social practice project, AutoNets, in Sao Paulo and Los Angeles, I've invited queer and trans people to, and allies to use their bodies and express concepts of safety, violence, and community-based responses to violence. So in these workshops, we use theory of the oppressed, and I ask people, for one, I ask people, what kinds of violence have you faced, on a, do you face on a daily basis, and how could we use technology to reduce or stop those forms of violence? Um, which early on, uh, totally blew my original thinking out of the water, because uh, the whole, the whole original concept for this thing with the wearable electronics is based on this narrative of stranger danger, right? That as if most sexual assault happened by random strangers in the street in a dark alley, which is a really racialized narrative. Uh, when in fact, you know, maybe like 97 or 98 percent of sexual assault happens in your home by someone you know. So part of the inspiration for this project was learning that I was a survivor of childhood sexual assault. Uh, so even in my like original thinking, clearly I was not really thinking because I was like, oh, I want to spend my time stopping sexual assault, but the method that I used to start thinking about it wouldn't, didn't actually respond to my personal situation. So my first workshop in Autonets was with this group of teens in Riverside that had this event called Punk Ass Queers and they invited me to come talk. And when I asked them, what kinds of violence do you face on a daily basis? They were like, uh, the violence of images, the violence of lesbophobia, the violence of cisgender privilege. Um, so immediately they were thinking about different kinds of violence than I was thinking about. Um, so what I've asked people in these workshops is what kinds of violence do you face? Um, but also we use performative embodied exercises, which we'll see in a moment, I swear, to ask people to, to demonstrate with their body, like, so what does violence look like? Or what does safety look like? Or what does safety feel like in your body? Or what could safety feel like in your body if it's something that you never feel? Um, and then make those images, we took those images and added movement and then made performances out of them, which you'll see in a moment. Okay. So I would say that these performances demonstrate Zielinska and Kember's concept of the cut as an act which creates relations, creates relations and networks, and also reveals forms of mediation and open the possibility of a post-digital cut. So I'll consider how movement can act as a form of communication that can offer a possibility of decolonizing digital networks, moving from the ideas embodied in digital networks toward an embodied network which is nevertheless still mediated by the technology. Nonverbal embodied forms of communication in this context become a form of relation enabled by the experience of violence and the skills learned in negotiating that violence on a daily basis. So how does this performance enact a cut in the field of mediation? Uh, hmm. Do I want to go on to this? Okay, fine. Uh, as Zelinska and Kemper claim that art can. So Zelinska and Kember describe photography as a kind of art that creates a cut by temporarily stabilizing an image. In the case of digital photography, this is a digital cut. I propose that movement makes a cut. Embodied physical movement, a part of dance, but a broader category than dance per se, enacts a cut into fields of mediation which can, which can be digital, 
but can also be non-digital or post-digital. Also, like a week ago, I was in Sweden at this conference, and somebody talked about trans-digital, and then I felt really silly and regressive. <laughs> so I plan to revisit this and think about the trans-digital in more detail, but have yet to do that. So in an effort to describe a relation to new media and a myth methodology that accounts for both the human and non-human, Zelinska and Kember articulate a broader concept of mediation, yet we foreclose it as the object of their study. They cite Nick Coldry's description of the range of the concept of mediation across disciplines from psychology, education, and media research to sociology, where, quote, the term mediation is used for any process of intermediation, such as money or transport. So thinking about movement as a cut, consider any intentional movement. Hold your hand in the air for a second. Yay, participation. <laughs> Gestures such as this one create a cut in the flow of daily utilitarian movement. Movement involves a change in speed, a slowing or quickening which differentiates the body from bodies around it, moving at the socially accepted speeds dictated by particular architectures. Movement also acts as a rich form of communication, as an activation of an archive of previous gestures. Holding your hand in the air in public space, like while sitting on a plane, may communicate to a steward to come to your seat, while in a classroom it may indicate a desire to speak, while on a sidewalk it may indicate a gesture out of place. Movement makes a cut by creating a relation between time and space, bodies and architecture. So repetition is a kind of temporality which allows movement to create a cut in the rhythms of daily motion. I claim that movement is a technology, it's a concept applied to materiality, the materiality of the body, which creates a change in the world. Repeated movement creates a relation between movement as a technology and the procedurality of digital technology. Choreography or even improvisation parameters can be described as a series of instructions. While they can be described in words, the richness of movement would require a great deal of linguistic work to be described accurately in detail, which indicates that this is a highly complex series of instructions akin to semantic programming languages which use human readable code to describe many machine level assembly language commands. When incorporating language for specific movements, as in the case of dance traditions such as ballet, colonial dance traditions such as ballet, in which one may learn over time to do a jeté or relevé, we begin to achieve a level of abstraction on the order of object-oriented programming languages. Consider that such moves can have multiple parameters, such as a relevé and plié, at a particular speed, one can see the echoes of function calls on objects in object-oriented languages. There are various methods for scoring dance movements. I've used some of these for other performances. But in We Already Know, we rely on visually showing each other the gestures instead of writing down scores. OK, my voice is tired. Let's stretch. I invite everyone to have some embodied participation and stretch upwards. And if you don't feel like standing, you can just imagine standing or do whatever upwards movement you feel like doing. And then stretch downwards. You might want to touch your toes. OK. So all this talk about embodiment, hopefully that little stretch tells us something about all the kinds of knowledge that are evacuated in this situation, in which I'm supposed to talk to you for 45 minutes or two hours, and the way that privileges verbal communication. Um, and also maybe hopefully that all puts our bodies a little more in sync, uh, if, since we did some similar action. Um, okay, so let's see one of these performances uh, in the Autonet series. That's the one that we did in Brazil, specifically thinking about nonverbal communication. One such performance in this series was titled "We Already Know and We Don't Yet Know." It took place in Sao Paulo, Brazil, at the Hemispheric Institute of Performance and Politics, Eighth Encuentro. Encuentro. The performance was the outcome of a three-day workshop using dance, performance, and theater of the oppressed exercises. So as of November 20th in 2012, at least 265 transgender people had been killed that year, with the most murders, 126 occurring in Brazil, which I, which I did not know until after I arrived. 
The U.S.-based National Coalition of Anti-Violence Programs reported in 2011 that the murder rate of LGBTQ people was at its highest point ever with transgender women and people of color, and transgender women of color, therefore, being the most likely targets, most common targets. So the gestures in this performance physically expressed the participants' ideas and memories of safety. After three days of conversation about prison abolition and community-based responses to violence, the prompt to create the gestures in the performance was simply the word safety. So in We Already Know, the bodies of the eight performers create a cut in the field of mediation created by transnational art contexts by moving in a public space with a shared speed. The fields of mediation being engaged with in this context include digital video and photography as well as networked media. As can be seen in the photo, well, <laughs> in the video, audience members, potentially international art festival attendees and potentially street bystanders, are engaged in photographing the event with their digital cameras. This video itself was taken by an audience member in the form of a digital video shot with an iPhone, thus it's not that good, sorry, and was later uploaded to social media. The existence of this photo demonstrates that the performers, by moving in this context, cut into multiple fields of mediation. So what I appreciate about Zelinska and Kember's intervention is that they're saying that to talk about new media and to make new media art, we don't have to make devices and we don't have to talk about iPhones or iSchools <laughs> or iPods or whatever, iDevices, um, that we live and exist in multiple fields of mediation already and the question is how to ethically cut through those fields or how to intervene in those fields. Okay. So by, here to, by having a shared position and being separated in space from the audience, it's apparent that these movements are a performative gesture. Additionally, by moving with a shared appearance, wearing similar kinds, of colors, kinds and colors of clothing, the performers in this video differentiate themselves from the audience and call attention to their movement. Gestures can cut fields of digital mediation by entering into an engagement with their temporalities, but they can also cut into other fields of mediation. I propose that gender, race, sexuality, and ability act as fields of mediation, intervening directly in the perception of bodies through social conditioning, and that these fields of mediation can also be cut in the way that digital fields can. While cuts in digital fields of mediation may create relations between digital objects, I would hold that cuts into fields such as gender and race create relations which are non-digital, opening a space for a concept of a pre-digital and post-digital cut. So the danger here is that the definition of a field of mediation may become too broad and have, to have any meaning. Yet my interest in this talk is to work towards a decolonization of the digital, a post-media and post-digital configuration, which can still abstract and learn from digital technologies to consider conce concepts such as a field of mediation, which start with digital technologies but move beyond them. Given that Zelinska and Kember's definition of mediation includes, quote, a thesis that mediation can be seen as another term for life, for being in and emerging with the world. It seems within their scope to consider gender and race as fields of mediation, especially given claims that gender is a technology by Halberstam <laughs> and uh, that race operates as a kind of code by Nakamura and Chow White. Both of, the, both of these fields of mediation, as well as sexual, uh, sexuality and ability, can be seen as material fields constituted by such matter as clothing, skin, hair, and gesture. Also considering Karen Barad's notion of the agential cut, which considers how to engage with the agency of matter and how to raise questions in a world which is relational, durational, and constantly becoming, the use of gesture and dance and performance to express particular racialized gendered forms of embodiment emerges as a usage of duration, which may create an agential cut. So Linska and Kember state that the practice of cutting is crucial not just to our being in and relating to the world, but also to our becoming with the world, as well as becoming different from the world. This last pair, becoming with and becoming different from, seem particularly relevant to a trans of color analysis which considers the place of people whose modes of being take as a necessary gesture of becoming, uh, wait, sorry, which considers the place of people whose modes of being take as a necessity a gesture of becoming different from one's assigned gender at birth, even in a racialized context where such a choice adds to an already precarious existence. So towards a trans of color praxis, one can ask how the performers in We Already Know create cuts across the fields of mediation created by gender, sexuality, and race simultaneously. 
how they make cuts across these fields simultaneously, which intersect with considerations of ability and class as well. I will try to wrap up in 10 minutes. Using movement to bring attention to their bodies, the performer's particular forms of embodiment become part of the content of the work of art. This is a photo from the workshop, one of the workshops in Brazil. So using movement to bring attention, oh yeah, I said that. Additionally, choosing a context in which the only part of the artwork is the performer's bodies, their clothes, and the public space of the street further creates this emphasis on the performer's bodies, giving their bodies a temporary ability to cut into the flow of genders and races of bodies on this particular street. In this performance, there's only one trans person of color performing, yet their presence in this group of other performers indicates its own cut, internal to the piece, which creates a relation between the performers, allowing the audience to look at and compare the embodiments of different bodies, at times doing the same gesture, at other times doing different gestures. This is uh, the website for Cerro 29, the group in Bogota, which helped me plan that workshop in Brazil. The content of the gesture adds to the distinctness of the cut that the performers are making in these fields of gender, sexuality, race, and ability. One gesture is led by a black woman and involves a hand folded into a pointing gesture, possibly referencing the shape of a gun. This gesture proceeds into her placing her hands behind her head, making a clear reference to an arrest. The gesture is performed by everyone in the group simultaneously. The gesture invites the watching audience into a consideration of two different forms of violence. Yet performed by multiple bodies of these performers, it becomes a consideration of violence against and violence perpetrated by women of color, men of color, and transgender women of color. By enacting this moment in the public space of the street, it becomes a consideration of these forms of violence as they may occur in public spaces such as this one, which was actually a site that was very frequent site of police violence against uh, skateboarders. The temporal and spatial coincidence of these particular movements on these bodies in this space creates a cut that establishes a relation between eight bodies on the street and previous and future moments of violence and incarceration. Additionally, considering that some of the performers' bodies are operating under pharmaceutical modifications such as prescribed hormones or mood drugs, which require diagnoses of illness to acquire. The bodies are also operating within fields of mediation that are unseen. Cuts into the field of mediation of concepts of ability may reveal the operation of ableism, the assumptions about trans people's status as mentally ill, or the workings of medical surveillance. The meanings of these cuts and their ethical status changes based on how each performer's body is read by the audience as a straight black man, a queer Latina, or a trans person of mixed race. To further elaborate the ethical status of each gesture, one would need to consider the cut as a transversal cut through multiple simultaneous fields, having different operations in each of those fields. Yet what they share is that they're examples of one operation in a trans of color praxis, that is using survival skills learned by navigating violence in order to create art and technology. As bodies acting in public space and therefore subject to police surveillance, these gestures potentially make a cut in the records of police databases. One field of mediation which can be understood to be operating on this street in Brazil is the field created by police surveillance technologies, be that the presence of officers' eyes radioing in their position and writing down their activities, or the video cameras embedded in the traffic lights in close proximity to this performance, or embedded in the cars of police driving by under the watching mechanisms in overhead helicopters or in the permit mechanisms which an art festival may apply for through to request usage of a public space. So transgender theorist Dean Spade writes in Normal Life of some of the stakes of existing in multiple simultaneous mediation. His work in many ways reproduces the writing of Vivian Namaste in Invisible Lives, who considered the ways that indigenous HIV positive and sex working trans women in Quebec are multiply erased by corporate media, the medical industrial complex, and the prison industrial complex. Yet, Spade's discussion, usefully, brings in a consideration of database technology and a focus on interventions at the level of the law. Although I would qualify, like, I'm, n I'm not endorsing like a broader usage of Dean Spade's theories. I think that endorsing a politics of impossibility and failure from a position of white masculine privilege is deeply problematic. Um, yeah, but let's just talk about this specific thing. Um, so not only do the movements of people in public space enter into a field of mediation by being recorded by police with the means described above, some of these recordings are remediated into larger databases. For example, in, uh, oh gosh, do we really have time for that example? So, so for example, another performance in the Autonet series 
called uh, AutoNet's Los Angeles with Gender Justice LA took place on the sidewalk just outside the University of Southern California campus. In this performance, a police officer approached the group and asked to speak to me, as I was the artist on record for the performance, and asked for my government ID. Surely interactions such as these are recorded, written down, and entered into digital databases. This form of mediation invites a consideration of Spade's larger analysis based on a critical trans politics. Oh, so yes, I should take this out and replace it with something from Namaste, but I'll do that later. Spade writes of the ways that IDs are used as a means of causing harm to trans people and reducing their life chances by increasing their risk of violence. He says the declaration of the war on terror ushered in a range of policy reforms. New practices have emerged and various agencies now compare their entire data sets and seek out mismatched information. The practice of recording people's movement into multiple databases and then comparing the data in those databases can be thought as a remediation of multiple mediations which reveals some of the ethical stakes and dangers of living in multiple mediations. So while these dangers exist as a concern for everyone, they're acutely present for trans people who may have mismatching identifications such as a driver's license with a female gender and a passport with a male gender, as in my case, as in my getting to this talk today required dealing with a international not today, but my getting to this talk in general required dealing with an international border with which I, d I don't have an ID that matches my current gender. Um, so certainly thinking about philosophy in action, <laughs> thinking about all the things that are required for us to do these things. Um, so Spade writes, the use of gender as a category for data of data for sorting populations, something that's taken as neutral and obvious to most administrators, operates as a vector of vulnerability for trans people. And further, the performance at USC was a response to the vulnerability created by the purportedly neutral gesture of asking for student IDs at the entrances to the campus. So I will summarize some of this. Um, so in this performance at uh, Los Angeles, at, U, at my university that I go to at USC, when I asked participants in Gender Justice LA, what kinds of violence do you face, uh, are you facing on a daily basis, they said, and the university is in enacting a violence on us because they en enacted a new policy that says that to get on university grounds after 8 p.m., you have to have a government-issued ID. So for transgender people or for undocumented people, this creates a situation where you cannot get on campus. Um, so they decided that we would do our Autonet's Los Angeles action at this little miniature, uh, at this miniature checkpoint that the university sets up that's right here the little expand a border fence where they ask everyone for their IDs. So Zelensky and Kember describe an ethical cut into a field of mediation, as I have described. Uh, and they, they describe the ethical cut, the eth ethics of this cut, that ethical cut is a cut that opens possibilities. So I find this disappointingly Deleuzean and insufficient and just, in, there are so many possibilities. As, as one can understand, a security checkpoint as a cut and defeat a field of mediation, which opens possibilities for surveillance and control. Uh, there's so many possibilities, right? Possibilities for more prisons. Uh, all these possibilities, I don't think those are ethical cuts. So my question is, is an ethical cut one that opens possibilities, or possibilities for what? So the particular kind of possibilities must be evaluated. So using Glissant's concept of a poetics of relation in combination with Zelinska and Kember's concept of the ethical cut, I propose that one form of ethical cut is a cut that opens possibilities for decolonization. So following Eve Tuck and Wayne Yang, I agree that decolonization in the settler colonial context must involve the repatriation of land simultaneous to the recognition of how land and relations to land have always already been differently understood and enacted that is, all the land, not just symbolically. So basically, they, they are saying that when we're talking about decolon, their title of their article is Decolonization is Not a Metaphor. So that when we're talking about decolonization, we should, part of that is to be talking about giving land back to the indigenous people it was stolen from. So along with the re, this repatriation of land must come a dismantling of the mechanisms by which this land is held, including prisons. As Yang and Tuck state, ghetto colonialism, prisons, and under-resourced compulsory schooling are specializations of settler colonialism in North America. They're produced by the collapsing of internal, external, and settler colonialisms into new blended categories. So in differentiating decolonization as a specific struggle to return land to indigenous peoples from a broader, from a broader conception of social justice, Yang and Tuck make a crucial point about freedom, citing Audre Lorde, who states, 
Within these deep places, each one of us holds an incredible reserve of creativity and power, of unexamined and unrecorded emotion and feeling. The woman's place of power within each of us is neither white nor surface. It is dark, ancient, and deep. Yang and Tuck rely on Lord here to point out that freedom is a possibility that's not just mentally generated, it's particular and felt, which lends support to the idea that an embodied gesture can be a kind of cut that moves towards decolonization by offering a temporary stabilization of a feeling of freedom. Although I would caution about the dangerous essentialism of Audre Lorde, which Sharon Holland discusses in great detail in The Erotic Life of Racism. And to conclude, I've considered how a trans of color praxis can work as a method of using the knowledge gained by navigating violence to make digital and post-digital art. What do I want to show for this conclusion? Uh, let's show that piece from Berlin. Um, through collective knowledge production with Autonets, myself and my collaborators have explored how movement can act as a technology of communication and how this can be extended through wearable electronics. These movements developed in an international performance art context, or sometimes just on the street or in train stations, as in this case, and distributed through global networks of mediated communication can be said to enact the concept of an ethical cut proposed by Zelinska and Kimber. Yet I wish to extend their claims at the ethical status of a cut to include cuts, to include cuts which specifically open possibilities for prison abolition, decolonization, and gender justice. The two performances of local autonomy networks I described are attempts at ethical cuts with these goals, working towards prison abolition and gender justice while relying on the decolonial strategy of opacity described by Glissant, which I didn't get into much. Following Yang and Tuck, the decolonial claims could be made stronger by making more explicit links to indigenous sovereignty, but as they were enacted, these works were in solidarity with decolonization movements and attempts to dismantle the structures which support colonialism, namely prison abolition and the gender binary system. By specifically focusing on reducing violence against trans people of color without relying on prisons and police. My hope for Autonets is to create cuts in the fields of mediation of gender, race, sexuality, ability, fashion, and police surveillance in order to break with everyday demands for transparent political and technical efficacy, what I might call techno machismo, the idea that the better technology means better art. An everyday movement, instead of and instead using opacity to open a space of imagination for decolonial abolitionist and queer politics. So what's the role of creative production such as dance and poetry, which may seem to be not material, materially useful for a struggle to wrest our lives back from corporations? Present forms of network communication are dependent on corporate and state structures that are incompatible with the visionary politics of prison abolition, decolonization, and gender justice. What I'm proposing is to leave a binary of internal subversion over escape to an outside, instead focusing on the conceptual work necessary to understand what digital networks provide and how those can be replaced with non-corporate tools, and also focusing on the affective work necessary in the process for healing, to support the work of transition, and as a means of prefiguring a world where we don't put people in cages now instead of waiting for it to come about. Thank you. Maybe I missed it, like the, about the wearable um, piece and how the device works. Like, so are the flash, like are the LEDs connected to, like, so are the signals reflected in the LEDs? Like, how, how does that work? Like, the yes. signals and the lights. So the prototypes I made so far, like I said, they they like, flash at a speed that depends on proximity. Like you're getting hotter or you're getting colder. So they would flash faster when you're getting closer to the person. The idea of making a hoodie was to have a, like a heads-up directional indicator that would tell you like you need to go left. But without GPS, that's really difficult. Um, I have like a plan to work with allied media projects and do some XB distance triangulation with nodes that don't move because they have like a mesh network on in neighborhoods on buildings. But as of right now, it just flashes based on how close or far you are from the person. This particular hoodie is just for performances and only has LEDs and a lily pad. It doesn't have the wireless transmitter. Three of the things that I'm interested in, I've been kind of parachuting in this world because we're an environmental activist and different kind of, but I'm very much concerned about freedom, activism, um, safety worldwide, um, and those are the kind of themes that I see 
the technology that's interfacing with barriers are is corporate control and things like we're, we're trying to just ideally you have a machine that ran off the battery of the body the heart that somehow was connected to as long as you were alive you were running the thing maybe there was battery backup you could be deceased or endangered or something like that and was transmitting much like our, our power infrastructure should be instead of being centralized it's a network of individual um, networks that are sending signals to each other so what's the obstacle of having global positioning from an agreed upon network of nodes uh, is there a way of subverting the satellite and corporate control to, to do that well i think that in my project the opposition to using gps came specifically from groups that were already under surveillance and they were, the violence they were opposing was state violence. So they were really concerned about not sharing their GPS coordinates. Sure. Because I mean like with the, so the way GPS works, right, is just to like, to map somewhere, theoretically, you're only receiving signals, you're not giving away your location. But in a moment of violence, if you need, you know, if you need to transmit your coordinates to somewhere else, then you might be transmitting them to the police. Because it's really hard to guarantee that right. the police have not arrested someone who, and they have your device. Well, that's what I'm wondering. Is there a, G, a way of transmitting GPS coordinates to those who you, you feel safe transmitting that information to? So you have a network of allies or friends, and you're able to do a GPS to like help them in trouble. This is where I am without plugging into the police network or the official network or the satellite network. Yeah, but then you just get into general security questions like the man in the middle problem, or like I said, like a lot of people have brought up the concern that like, even if you, even if you have, because XP's have encryption, and they have encryption that includes like a specific key, so you could, you could just have like you and your five friends have the encryption key, and you, only, you can only communicate with each other. But the groups I was working with were very concerned that that means all the police have to do is arrest one of your five friends, and then they know your location. So there's like these big security questions that with GPS are hard to solve, which is still an ongoing problem. I mean, XP doesn't really solve it. Because um, if the device directs you basically to your friend, then it's still a problem. But also I think that people just have these, um, you know, part of the work of this project is like interfacing with people who are not very familiar with digital technology or not, uh, not necessarily excited about digital technology who have associations with GPS that are emotional. So somebody's like worn a GPS bracelet because they're on parole, they're really not going to want to wear a GPS bracelet that's supposed to make them safer. And those emotional components are, to me, really important. So the thing I'm most interested in, the whole, the whole thing is really interesting, obviously, but um, I, uh, I'm fascinated by these performances in Brazil, and I'm particularly fascinated by the way they convey, um, they convey a network, obviously, in the way that people are able to interact and move together, and there's just, it's just so rich, and the fact that it's taking place in these sort of public spaces is really interesting. And every, this is now the second time I've seen it. I actually saw it at the Congress on Research and Dance at Los Angeles, in Los Angeles, oh, yes. UCLA. Yeah. And because um, we were on that panel together. Yeah, we were on a panel together yes. in LA. <laughs> um, and um, what it reminded me of then and now is <clears throat> other forms of non-human networks, like birds, mm -hmm. right? Um, communicating in obviously not the same way, but these movements seem to, for whatever reason, I can name the reasons, but these movements seem to conjure up the way birds move together and flock together. And I just thought maybe, I'm throwing that out there as like an, a, a totally unformed thought, um, but I thought I'd give it back to you and see what you have to say about that. Yes, so um, we're actually using a like, dance choreographic technique called flocking. <laughs> so um, what we do in the workshop is like practice flocking. Uh, and so that usually, yeah, so that involves like us standing in a clump. It's a technical choreographic term, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> and standing in a clump and whoever is in the front of the clump does whatever their gesture is and everyone else just tries to mimic their gesture. Yeah. And sometimes flocking is done. Is that what's happening in Brazil? Yes. Okay. So sometimes flocking is done in dance, like improvisationally, where the person in the front of the flock does whatever they want and everybody else tries to emulate it. But what we're doing is 
so I said, I asked people, like, what does safety look like to you, look like in your body, what does it feel like in your body? And then people made these gestures, um, and then we, like, they showed them to the rest of the group. So we practiced each other's gestures a few times in the workshop. And then when we flopped, whoever was in the front would do their gesture. So we've already like, practiced the gesture a little bit. Um, but we're still not really going for precision, because it's certainly part of what I think is interesting about the performance is like the, the repetition of the movement on different bodies. Um, and another parameter of the Brazil performance. So I've used blocking a lot in these Autonauts performances. Um, and in particular, because it, it's been for me a really good way to go from a workshop theater of the oppressed process that's like really private and, and personal to like deciding what we're going to do in front of a public for 20 minutes or 10 minutes or something. Um, but in particular in the Brazil performance, there was like an additional parameter that was that people could, because we were working on communication, people would like leave or join the flock as they wanted to or as they were like signaled by. So if they felt like somebody was calling everybody together, then they would all like flock together, which also we did in San Jose. So in San Jose, we specifically had everybody disperse, and then when somebody turned on their hoodie, everybody would come together and then do their flocking gestures and then break up again. The San Jose video is on the, my website. Um, but, oh yeah, so what was different about Sao Paulo though was that people could either flock or they could do their own individual thing. Because it was at the Hemisphere Institute of Performance and Politics, so all those people are already like super talented, experienced performers. But usually the people I'm working with are like activists or very new to movement um, or just like people who feel that they're affected by violence who maybe are not dancing every day. Um, so then usually follow a more rigid flocking mechanism. I have a little bit of a question on the LED light. Does that indicate uh, an uh, the importance of privacy and consent in, in the wearables? Or where do you stand in relation to the issues of privacy and consent since that way it's come? Yeah. Um, I mean, consent is really central to the project. Um, I mean, the whole, you know, even from the beginning of the project, even when I was thinking this narrative of mostly stranger danger, I was still thinking about, okay, a central thing in this project is how to develop prison abolitionist techniques for stopping violence, because trans people of color don't want to call the police, or sexual assault <coughs> survivors often don't want to call the police because they cause more violence, right? So from the beginning, we were thinking, okay, I have this device. Nowadays, I think we have this device. It could be an electronic hoodie, or it could be my cell phone, or it could be my hand. And what do we do when somebody signals that they need help? So from the beginning, it, the workshops were really about like building relationships um, as like a central femme politic of building relationships and being central political work. Because for us to feel safe, we would have to like feel pretty reliable that when I press the button, somebody's going to come. Um, you know, so consent is really central. Um, and hmm, privacy. I'm not. I'm eating a Ricola because we had this fabulous workshop this morning and a talk on the same day, and my throat is very tired. Um, I'm not so. I'm not 100 percent sure how privacy goes in, except for like not using GPS over those concerns of locational privacy. Um, I mean, something I've thought about in making these is that, I mean, it was just like my initial idea was like, would people need help? The lights come on, but that could be really bad, mm -hmm. right? Um, yeah, especially for. But you need help, you don't want consent necessarily. You think it subverts consent at a certain point. Yeah, but I think also when you need help, you might want privacy. Yeah. Um, like in particular, sex workers were like, okay, if, you're if we're going to use these things, then they have to look good. Exactly. And they, or they have to be totally covert, um, which is part of why this garment, a couple of the garments I designed were designed to be covert until you turn them on. So um, we made this one vest, Ben Plunker is the designer from, uh, who helped me make them. So we made this one vest that like looks fairly normal, and then when you pull the zipper, the electronics were under the zipper uh, and would turn on based on the zipper. But like with that one, I tried to hide the electronics inside the seam instead of like putting them right on your wrist. Um, yeah, because then, I mean, in a lot of play, a lot of cases, these fancy kind of science fiction prototypes could easily attract more attention and create more danger for somebody. Yeah. yeah. But also, the project, as like kind of all my projects are, are I feel like 
on this, in this tension between uh, being speculative and being practical. So, um, yeah, they're not quite telepathy yet. Uh, mm -hmm. But hopefully, like by people getting face to face with their friends or their community members to talk about violence, they might feel a little safer talking to them about violence next time. And, like, it's actually been my experience in these workshops, like when I lived in Los Angeles, that I was like, oh, yeah, I actually feel a little better now texting people and being like, I feel really unsafe right now because we just talked about it for three hours in the workshop. I, I feel super nervous asking the questions. I'm not sure why, but I'm going to uh, <laughs> push through that. Um, so as a, I guess, a, a cis white guy, um, I admit that I don't have, um, I don't, the experience of, of trans people is something that's, that's, um, uh, that, uh, I guess because I don't know what that experience is, I, I, I ask the question. I, I, I do understand that, um, that violence is experienced in the community in a very uh, significant way. And I, I also think, though, that, um, that, that uh, oppressed peoples often uh, need to use violence as a way of, um, of speaking and, and um, a being, I guess, in some way, and I wonder how that uh, uh, that plays into uh, some of the questions that you're working with. Yeah, thanks. That's a great question. Um, that's part of why I am I'm kind of at the point of this project of like documenting it and moving on, because. Um, I feel at this point now, I've talked to so many people about so many different kinds of violence and thought about violence for a few years and like, yeah, Glissant talks about the violence of the thought of anti-violence. <laughs> um, and there's so many different forms of violence and some of them are important and useful, right? Like decolonial violence, right? In Fanon. Um, and so, yeah. I agree. <laughs> yes, there are useful forms of violence. And that's part of why I'm working, starting to work on other projects. Well, thank you very much. Thank you.